We're taking time in a few Sunday nights now together to look at uh, attitudes and emotions. And uh, two messages on attitudes. Uh, last time we looked at attitudes, we shared with you the great attitudes, G-R-A-T-E, the GER attitudes, and how to break them. And we at that time, two weeks ago, looked at seven attitudes which appeared to have grated the Lord. Attitudes like the closed mind, my mind's made up, don't confuse me with the facts. Put downs, you'll never amount to anything. Judgmental attitude, there's something wrong with you. Holier than thou, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm better than you. Misplaced priorities, but I've got to do this first. Negative orientation, the answer is no. And indecision or apathy, I can't or I won't make up my mind, I don't care or I give up. There are more great attitudes than these, G-R-A-T-E, but I'm sure if you will faithfully practice those seven great attitudes, you will be nasty all over. <laughs> Tonight we want to look at the great attitudes, G-R-E-A-T, the great attitudes and how to make them. And I was instinctively led to one of my very favorite passages in all the Bible, which I've preached on a number of times in my years pastoring this church, but I didn't want to re-preach a message. And so I went back and uh, put some new things to it, remembering that uh, every scribe that is trained for the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, is like a householder that brings out of his treasure something that is old and something that is new. And as far as I am concerned, in looking at Scripture, one of the ways to keep it fresh, if it's a well-known passage, is to continue to come back to it and look at it through the lens of the present moment. It's one of the reasons why I personally don't underline in my Bible is that I'm afraid if I begin underlining, next time I read that passage, I say, oh, I, cu I cut the message of that last time, and I won't read it again. And some people underline because they actually then highlight it, but I underline stuff, and then I skip over it when I read it next time. So I want to try to see things new. And the greatest attitudes that were ever given are where? The Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Now I did not consult Robert Schuller's book in order to get the attitudes here. I deliberately stayed away from that book and I'm sure it was loaded with scintillating phrases and the like, but I didn't, when I, my problem is when I read somebody that's got great phrases, I tend not to filter the scripture myself and just grab what is out there. So if you have read that book or heard that message, a, a, a series of messages, then uh, sit back tonight. I've tried to just understand these as I've looked at them on my own. Uh, one of the persons that was with us in our Israeli tour last year used a phrase of these great attitudes that stuck in my mind very powerfully, and it was the phrase that these are the beautiful attitudes. If you will live consciously with the eight attitudes which characterize the B attitudes, and they are B attitudes after all, life will be profoundly different. In fact, if you study, and when you study the Sermon on the Mount, you know that that is Jesus' inaugural address. Just as a president makes an inaugural address when he begins a new term of service, so when Jesus institutes his term of service as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he institutes that address with an inauguration speech about life in his kingdom. And the very front end of that address is the kind of people that he will make out of his citizens. And I believe in doing first things first. And if we will catch the spirit of what Jesus is saying in these first eight great attitudes of life, all of life will be different. In fact, there are many more great attitudes than the eight great attitudes of the Beatitudes, but it's, but it's the kind of thing that if you have these working in your life, everything else will fall in place. Just like if you have the seven G-R-A-T-E attitudes, you'll be a thoroughly nasty person in many other ways. If you have these eight great G-R-E-A-T attitudes, it'll spill over and affect every single attitude you have. What are these beautiful and great attitudes? The first great attitude stated by Jesus in, is in words we're very familiar with is blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now I'm going to put a different phraseology to that to contemporize it a bit because we today don't run around in our everyday vernacular using that kind of language. When somebody's doing well, we don't 
put an arm around them and say, oh, that's just great. Remember, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And therefore, I want to use language we might be familiar with that express in a true sense what Jesus was getting across. And to me, the first great attitude that he is communicating can be summarized in three words. I need help. I need help. In the Greek language, which Matthew writes in, the word for poor can be translated one of two ways. And Matthew employs the word for poor that means the destitute poor. The person who truly has nothing, the person who is utterly dependent upon somebody else and comes to their recognition of need for help. Jesus, therefore, in giving us this teaching, I need help, is recognizing what John Donne would say later as a poet, no man or no woman is an island entire of himself. Jesus is stating to us, quite frankly, that the way to get into the kingdom of God is to admit our need for God's help and whoever would be in his kingdom must begin with an honest confession of need. I cannot save myself. I cannot forgive myself. I cannot gain salvation on my own. I cannot work my way, buy my way, maneuver my way, manipulate my way into the kingdom of God. I come as a person in total dependence upon God. I need help. And I would suggest that that spirit of dependency is needed throughout our entire Christian life. There's never a point in our life where we no longer need either God's help or one another's help. There is no such thing as a self-sufficient person. And when, and when we really begin to get into emotional and spiritual and psychological trouble, it seems to me, is when we begin trying to do it all on our own and say to ourselves, I can do this without any assistance. We know, for example, that per persons that have alcohol and chemical dependency have to come to a point in their experience where they admit they have a need and begin to reach out for help. And there can never, and I've tried to help and I have seen others try to reach out and help people who have alcohol and, and chemical dependencies and it's extremely frustrating when you want to do everything you can to help such a person. But the person themselves will not come to the point of frank and honest admission, I need help and I will do anything to get it. I cannot do this on my own. I would suggest that uh, if you are not making progress, for example, on breaking out of a problem that you're struggling with, that you should consider getting help. I know the importance of help. I think on the physical level that there have been occasions in my own family life where I've seen how help uh, and, this, and the, uh, the whole idea of uh, we can get tough this one out has been very costly. My mom and my dad, for example, both really died of a heart failure. And when my dad had his first heart attack some years after mother had had her fatal heart attack, we immediately, by that time we knew the signals, got him uh, to the, to the uh, emergency room just like that. But when mom had her heart attack, I, uh, it wasn't quite sure. The symptoms weren't read too well. And mom and dad uh, were trying to say, well, you know, maybe this is uh, an upset of some kind and, and let it go on for about eight or nine hours because they weren't sure they wanted to call for help. And mother was very, very sensitive about ever going to a doctor or going to a hospital. And, and uh, I can uh, remember my sister telling me that mom, as ill as she was that morning uh, after she'd spent a night wrestling with this, just had to get herself dressed because she wasn't going to the emergency room not looking well, even though she had had a, it turned out to be a rather massive heart attack. We learned a little bit, I think, through that, that, that when we're going through physical needs, it's no time to play around. When Jewel has, has asthma very bad right now, and, and uh, we have, we've had to adopt a strategy that when she begins to have difficulty with her breathing and the medication isn't clearing it up, it's time to get to the emergency room no matter what time it is in the day or night. And a few weeks ago, we were down at Hoagie Emergency at about 4 o'clock in the morning getting that treated because there, you can't let stuff like that go. And I think that's true on the, uh, uh, certainly on the emotional and spiritual level as well. There are marriages which are in cardiac arrest, just like there are bodies that are in cardiac arrest. And the husband or the wife is saying, well, we're not going to go to any marriage counselor. We're not going to go to any marriage seminar. That's for other people who are in trouble. And all the time what we need to do is to reach out and say, I need help. Charlotte, Charlotte Perot, who has spoken at our church and is founder of Colonial Vigo Orphanage, made a statement one time, and her and Chuck has, have one of the best marriages I've ever seen in a couple. They are just dynamic and alive in Christ, been married joyfully for, I don't know, 35, 40 years. 
Charlotte made a statement, though, one time in a retreat that stuck in my mind. She said, I read at least one book a year which will help me build a better marriage with Chuck. And the thing that, uh, that amazed me was they have such a good marriage, I would have said to uh, her, why would you need to read anything? You're doing it so well. But she had a spirit of dependency, of saying, I need help. Marriage is a, is a, is a, is a matter which you've got to keep working on, and you keep needing other people to help you with it. The Bible tells us to bear one another's burdens, and therefore we need to share our needs with one another. We can choose in life to be independent, dependent, or interdependent. And the third, interdependent, where we are strong enough to say we're weak and we need other people and yet we're not a doormat either, that kind of saying, I need help, is what the Lord is commending to us. I'm trying to have no hesitancy as a pastor to say on occasion, I need help. And uh, that's an attitude that Jesus himself had. You know, Jesus, when you look at it, the divine Son of God who could do miracles from a, from a theological point of view probably didn't need anybody. But he chose to come and express this great attitude himself and gather people around him to whom basically he said, I need help. I'm going to use you and I'm going to reach the world through you. I'm not going to do it by myself. Will you join in my cause? And in fact, in the Lord's greatest hour of human need, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sat his disciples down, and he didn't say, I'm going to handle this matter all by myself. I'm strong enough. I'm the Son of God. I believe I can handle this one on my own. He said to his disciples, I'm very depressed. Will you pray with me? Well, that's my translation, but that's what he said. My soul is girded about with sorrows, is the literal word here that's used. I am wrapped around with troubles. Pray with me. I need help. Now, if it offends your idea of the divinity of God that he would say that, remember that Jesus was also human. He was the God-man, and he could say it. And if he could say, I need help, in the hour of his sorrow and need, then we have permission to say it when we're going through something. It's a great attitude to say when we need to say it, I need help. Second great attitude that uh, comes out of the beautiful attitudes is, I am sorry. <laughs> I am sorry. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What is a person who is mourning? Is a person who is expressing regrets for things, or in some cases maybe expressing empathy for others. The attitude of I am sorry is a vital attitude if we're to become truly righteous people. For honesty is the key to every successful relationship, starting with our honesty to God. And Jesus asks us to enter that relationship with him by not only admitting we have need, but admitting we have been wrong and saying to him as we begin that relationship, I am sorry. I find it easier to confess to God than to admit that I am wrong to another human being. Maybe you find that way as well. God is perfect and therefore I know he can't ever be in the wrong. And if I say I'm in the wrong, I'm safe in confessing it to God because I know whatever responsibility for error is in the relationship, I bear it. But if I say to another person, I'm sorry, I am generally saying that to someone who bears some responsibility for the problem as well. And I don't want to be just unilateral about this. I'd prefer they would say first, I'm sorry, or maybe right after say, I am sorry, they would say, I am sorry also. But, but I found that that doesn't always work that way. I have had to say on occasion to a person whom I, it graded me like I'll get out to say I'm sorry, but the Holy Spirit had his hand on my life and said you're not going to get away with that kind of attitude and the harsh severity and tone of voice you used with that person. You're going to call them up and say I'm sorry. And this person was not the kind of person that anyone I don't think would enjoy apologizing to because they were mean and victim addictive and furthermore this person abused their wife that's why I had lost my temper with him and I had lost my temper so badly with him that uh, I needed to call back not and retract uh, the good counsel I had given but I had to retract the anger I had offered while giving him the peace of my mind he promptly did what I knew he would do said that I had expressed, to, he said this to other people, had expressed regret that I had rebuked him. And, uh, but that's the risk we take when we say, I'm sorry. We will not always be understood. I think these attitudes which Jesus stresses for us is uh, they're meant to be not just something we do once, 
But I am sorry is meant to be a kind of a permanent quality in our life. It's not something we just begin the Christian life with. It's uh, something that's used for maintenance in our life because our life is like my car that sits out in the street. It must be washed regularly. And I must say I'm sorry regularly. Could I ask you a kind of self-test question? How regularly do you admit to someone else that you are sorry? And don't buy the line, love is never having to say you're sorry. That's a lot of Hollywood, folks. Love is saying I'm sorry lots and lots of times over and over again. If you look at your life and it's been a long time since you've told anyone you're sorry about anything, then either you are living very much alone or you have become perfect or you have gotten terribly self-righteous. And it would be helpful for us to find a way to tell someone, I am sorry. If we're not saying, I am sorry, what we're doing is building defensive arguments to justify why we are not at fault. And we say, well, I don't have to say I'm sorry because you bear more responsibility for that than me anyway, and it's all your fault. Now, Jesus never had to tell anyone he was sorry. Therefore, this phrase, when used of him, blessed are those who mourn, would have to be translated a different way. It is obvious that Jesus did feel for people and wept over them and grieved for them. And in that sense, he truly mourned. Uh, sometimes I've had to say, not very often, because uh, I'm rather perfect in my relationship with my children, but sometimes I've had to say to them, I am sorry. I was never taught to do that. I was always taught that parents are strong, and you never tell your kids, I'm sorry, because they'll take advantage of you. And that is probably true. <laughs> but there are occasions where even as parents we need to say I'm sorry and could I say to young people here there are occasions when we need to tell our parents we're sorry. In saying I'm sorry I'm not advocating that we develop a doormat emotional life where we are always taking the blame for things and running along with a guilt trip in our life saying well I'm responsible for all every, every situation and every mess in relationship it's all my fault. I'm simply saying Jesus is telling us in this great B attitude this wonderful, beautiful attitude that we must have a continual sensitive spirit to him and to other people, and it is a key to successful living. I need help. I am sorry. The third great attitude is one that is exceedingly difficult to translate from the Greek into the English. And I, would you believe, spent hours on this this week trying to get a phrase that would capsulate the word that Matthew uses in the Greek language, which is a five-letter word, P-R-O-A-S, or some uh, one way it's spelled also is P-R-A-U-S, praos. It is a word which the English has come across as meek. Blessed are the meek. And uh, that word in no sense does the Greek word justice because in our language, meek has come to represent somebody that's limp-wristed or uh, mild and milpitose. And it actually represents something very strong and gentle. So I have come to say that the third great attitude is an attitude of life that says, I'm strong, but I'm easy to live with. I'm strong, but I'm easy to live with. Where did I get that? Because this word meek in the Greek language has three ways in which it is employed. It is first used as a concept to describe something that is wild that has been domesticated or broken, such as a wild stallion that has been of no profit when it has been wild, but it has now been broken. And I know that there are some people in this congregation that have had experience breaking horses, or your parents had that experience. And there's nothing so exciting as to take a horse that's filled with fire and spit and get him broken so that he will accommodate a saddle and a rider and his energies will be channeled and be used in a positive direction. That's what this word, that's one of the meanings of this word. Another meaning of this word is to describe a person who is balanced, who is uh, in between uh, two extremes. And they're, for example, this person is not always sad and not always happy, is not always pinching pennies and not just throwing away money, but is balanced and, and disciplined and in between. And then a third way to use this word is to describe someone who is gentle. And therefore, a number of times in the New Testament, it is translated directly as gentle. But none of these three definitions of the one word uh, 
accurately alone describe the word. It takes all three concepts together to make up the word, and that's why it's so difficult to translate. We just can't put it over into one word in the English language. It's interesting, when I looked up the theosaurus uh, for the word gentle, I found that the English theosaurus, the theosaurus now is something that gives synonyms for a word, in case some of you have not worked with a theosaurus, but uh, this theosaurus had accurately, uh, did I say that right? I see some, what did I say? That's why I said theosaurus. Did I say that wrong? Thesaurus? I don't know. Whatever it is, you know what it is. I just read words, I don't bother to enunciate them correctly. I'm a phonic pronouncer, and it looked to me like the phonics were that, but in, anyway. I remember Dear Harold Hunt, my first year pastoring, I'll tell this on Harold, I've got another story I'm going to tell him tonight, but I had talked in a sermon about, uh, I'd use this great French word, potpourri, and uh, Harold came to me after the service and said to me, Pastor, he said, the word you use this morning, potpourri, the correct pronunciation of that is potpourri. Oh, thank you very much. Where I was I? In the thing that has synonyms in it. The uh, English uh, synonym people have caught well the thrust of the principle underlying the word gentle out of the Greek language. So the synonyms for gentle are tamed, domesticated, housebroken, disciplined, educated, trained, civilized, tractable, pliable, taught, cultivated. Those are all bound up in this, I'm strong, but I'm easy to live with. I think of additional words like, I'm tough and tender. I'm strong, but flexible. This word describes a person who has a great driving inner core of life, who has a fire lit in their bosom. Some people live without any light in their eyes, but the meek person, the prowess person, is a person who lives with an inner fire. But they manage to stay balanced and centered and radiate joy, and they're fun to be with. Such a person is not given to erratic behavior or mood swings. And they even use anger effectively. Such, Jesus, for example, was a meek person, and yet he uh, could uh, cleanse the temple, couldn't he? And he could look around in a synagogue and stare people down. It's a great phrase in Mark chapter 3 when Jesus at one occasion looked around at a synagogue and the actual the word that's employed uh, suggests that he uh, eyeballed everybody in the synagogue until he had absolutely stared the place down in defiant silence. He was so angry with an attitude that he saw expressed. Um, the meek person uses anger effectively because they use it to bring creative and good change rather than employing it as a punitive measure. They use anger redemptively so that it may serve some good purpose and not anger just to lash out on punishment at people. The meek person is balanced. The meek person is not all work and not all play. There is a time to laugh and a time to weep. This person is disciplined. They do not live their life in chaos and upset, but are bringing order, purpose, clarity, and priority to life. The meek person is gentle. Look at how easy Jesus is to approach. John is leaning on his breast. He's tough, but he's tender. I'm strong, but I'm easy to live with. That's a great attitude. Uh, fourth great attitude is I want to keep growing. I want to keep growing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I think the Christian life is a balance between being content and not having attained. Paul admonishes us, for example, to be content. And then he'll turn right around and uh, say, forgetting the past and pressing on, I have not yet attained the goal. And if we're just settled down into a lackadaisical place in our own lives and say, well, I've arrived, we're in danger. But if we're all the time striving and striving and say, I've never accomplished anything, I've never been anywhere, never done anything, never who I wanted to be, I'm just endlessly pressing, 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 that's not healthy either. The attitude of hungry in spirit suggests an individual who says, although, it's, although I have had Christ's righteousness given to my life, I yet do not know all that I need to know. I have not experienced all I need to experience, either in him or in life. I want to keep growing in my relationship with God and with other people. One of the greatest examples of this in the Bible, to me, is Paul's fantastic second letter to Timothy, which is the last letter of the 13 that he writes. 
And he has a marvelous phrase in the near the end of that letter when he's doing a checklist to Timothy of the things that he wants. And in addition to wanting Timothy, which is to suggest that he wants friendship and fellowship, he tells Timothy to bring some things with him. And among the articles that he wanted, he wanted a cloak to keep him warm, but the other things that he wanted were the books and the parchments. And the parchments were the scriptures, the Torah, the scrolls. But the books... The books were the things that he enjoyed reading, the commentaries on the scriptures, or who knows what he was reading. I, I gather from reading Paul that he, he read some pagan authors because he quoted pagan poets when he was on Mars Hill. So he, he was a reader. And I'm saying as I read 2 Timothy, hey, wait a minute, Paul, what are you asking for books for? I can understand parchments. You want to read the Bible. I know you're down there in that maritime prison and you're in a hole and with a little daylight coming down the hole, you want to read the Bible. But what's this bit about books? Paul, you're right at your martyrdom. You yourself say, my point of departure is already at hand. Paul, there's no more sermons to preach. There's nothing to do. You're already in your late 60s. It's time to shut off the intellectual well and shut off learning. I mean, you quit growing, uh, don't you, at a certain point of time? What do you need to keep reading for? I mean, it's, it's useless. You've got maybe at the best a few days, maybe a few months to live, and, and you know enough. But he has this attitude, I want to keep on growing. So he's saying, get me the books. I want to keep reading. That is the most, for those of you that are in a college setting, that is one of the greatest statements for the liberal arts and for uh, uh, education for education's sake that I've ever heard in my life. A person who is not studying in order to get a degree, a person who's not studying in order to qualify with a kind of a deal, a, a, a credit of some kind in order to get a job, a person who is not studying in order to get the grade, but a person who is reading and studying for the joy of learning itself. Wow. I think that's great. Now, if you don't think that's great, we're on different wavelengths, but I just think, uh, when I get older, one of the things I want to do is I just want to go back to college, and I want to sit there, and I want to ask professors questions, and I want to learn. I think that would be so much fun to have, to have what, whatever money you would need to do so you didn't have any more financial worries and just go sit and learn for a while and learn all the great new stuff coming out. That would be great. Anyway, well, I think of Harold Hunt. I, here, I have this in my notes. Her, Harold came to me. Now, Harold's a granddad, okay? And he's just been on vacation down in the Bahamas, right? And somewhere down in the Caribbean or Caribbean, however you say that, Harold. And <laughs> He comes back the other day and he's passing around a photo and he says, look at me. And here's Harold Hunt. He's been out there on vacation, not just water skiing behind a boat, but he had one of these, I didn't even know there was such a sport. He's in one of these parachutes that I guess takes you off up in the air, right? And a boat's pulling you down in the water. And there's this photo, color photograph of Harold Hunt about three miles up in the sky with skis, you know, and he's got a parachute and he's ready to come down. I, Harold, that is fantastic. I don't think you'd ever done that before, had you? What are you now, 65? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Harold and June married when they were very young. And so Harold's about in his early 50s and is a granddad, and their son is getting married this month. But I just thought, that's super. That's what I'm talking about. It's, I'm never too old to learn. I want to keep on growing. Now, Jesus locates it as growing in righteousness, and righteousness to me is, is, is the kind of brush that's put over all of life. It doesn't simply mean to be pious and act religious, but it means to be in right standing with God and with other people and to live life in God to the full extent of your potential and capability. There's never an age in life where we should say, I have arrived, I know it all. Nor can we say ever in life, I have become totally like Christ. To grow in righteousness means to become more like him. If you would like uh, some little further study that you could do on your own to help you grow, I thought this week of the five greatest lists that, that would, uh, be, could be called growth lists that are in the New Testament. And I'm thinking about getting somebody to calligraphy these for me so that I could hang them on a wall or something because there are five lists in the New Testament. Now, there's a whole book out called the Book of Lists, but if you want to start a, another one, do a book of growth lists from the New Testament. There are eight great attitudes in the Beatitudes. There are 22 life responses in Romans 12, 9 to 21 that really describe how to live a power-packed life. 
There are 15 qualities of love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 6. There are nine fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. And there are seven add-ons to faith in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9. We add on to faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And if you take those five lists together, the Beatitudes, the life responses of Romans 12, the 15 qualities of love, 1 Corinthians 13, the nine fruit of the Spirit, and the seven add-ons to faith from 2 Peter 1, you'll have a list that you'll never get done working on no matter what age you live to. And by the way, I hope they discover this gene that doubles life. They're working on it. I think they were working on earthworms this last week, and they have discovered a gene that, that by splicing it made the earthworm live twice as long. Isn't that exciting? I just hope they get that thing solved before I get too much older. Never quit growing. I'm here to grow. It's a great attitude. Fifth grade attitude is the attitude, I care. I care. And it is uh, from the beatitude, blessed are the merciful. The merciful person is there to help. Therefore, is unlike the person who lives life with neglect toward others or lives life blaming others. The quality of mercy and of I care keeps us away from the deadly qualities of spirit that involve harshness, coldness, judgmentalness, and criticalness. A merciful person chooses to move out of their own hurt to help heal the hurt in another person. The Good Samaritan being a classic example, when he sees the man by the side of the road, he doesn't say, hey, you guys have hurt me so much by always making me an outcast, I can't get past my own hurt to help you and yours. But the caring person will move out of their own hurt to help in, with the hurt of another. Now, I need to take the great themes of Scripture and reduce them to practical daily living. And I say to myself, how can I be a more merciful person? I, now, the answer that I'm going to give is not going to help you in totality becoming merciful, but if you're having difficulty knowing better how to say I care for people, I came across a great little thing that I think is super, and then maybe it fits in a little bit with uh, some of the things I said in my morning message. But there is a, there is a whole thing on um, physical contact with people that is a way of expressing care. And um, I'm not sure I'm ready to call this a theology of hugging, but there is, a, there is a, some things that I ran across this week that I wanted to share. Dr. David Bressler, who's director of the pain co control unit at UCLA says, quote, I often tell my patients to use hugging as part of the therapy for pain. To be held is enormously therapeutic. A caring, I found that caring persons are by and large tactile persons. You understand? They use, they reach out and, and use the sense of touch. I care. So part of building I care is to become from our heart a more tactile kind of person. Dr. Harold Voth, senior psychiatrist at the prestigious Henninger Foundation in Topeka, Kansas says, hugging is an excellent tonic. It has been shown scientifically that people who are mentally run down and depressed are far more prone to sickness than those who are not. Hugging can lift depression, enabling the body's immune system to become tuned up. Hugging brings fresh life into a tired body and makes you feel young and more vibrant. In the home, daily hugging will strengthen relationships and significantly reduce friction. Dr. Voth adds, hug your spouse, your children, close friends or relatives. If you live alone, the warm embrace with a friend whenever you meet is just as beneficial. It's a marvelous way to improve your life. And Dr. Bressler adds, sometimes I just take out my prescription pad and then I write out a prescription for four hugs a day, one at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime. Ray Ortland, I heard one time speak on hug therapy and he said, we need five hugs a day for survival, eight hugs for maintenance, and 12 hugs for growth. Now, am I suggesting that hugging is what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are the merciful? Well, no, I'm not. But in his great story on mercy, the Good Samaritan holds the man that he helps. He has to hold him to carry him to the donkey. He has to hold him to carry him to the end. He held him. And I think that it, a great step to becoming a person who, who cares is to begin with the embrace and the reach out through touch. I care. That's a great attitude. A sixth great attitude is, oh, this one is tough. My conscience is clear. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. My conscience is clear. 
David has a great psalm, Psalm 32, which says, when he lived with unconfessed sin in his life, he had no rest at night. He tossed and turned on his bed. It was only when he brought to God the level of his sin that he received the cleansing and he was able to approach God. So when we find a phrase like this, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, we want to ask, is there any command or teaching of God that I am disobedient to? And we want to ask the Lord to help us with that and to forgive it. Paul makes a great statement that he lives before God with a clear conscience. The conscience or the heart only becomes clear through repentance. And repentance is to the heart what the tear duct is to the eye. When there's an impurity that gets in the eye, there's an involuntary muscle in most all of us that triggers a release of fluid that washes away the impurity. And the tear duct is absolutely necessary if we're to have purity of sight. And Jesus says if you're to have purity of heart, there must be another involuntary spiritual muscle that is triggered, and that must be the involuntary muscle of repentance that brings us a clear conscience that is devoid of offense toward man or toward God. Rather than living with unconfessed and repeated sin in our life, the Lord calls us to a high plane of living that says, I want to live with the attitude before God I have a clear conscience. A seventh great attitude is... Let me be your friend. Let me be your friend. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And a peacemaker is a person who comes alongside another and is a friend. A friend who tries to break up enmity between two parties or someone who tries to break through the logjam of relationship that they have with enmity with another person. George Herbert, a 17th century English poet and philosopher, said, he who cannot forgive others destroys the bridge over which he himself must pass. He who cannot forgive others destroys the bridge over which he himself must pass. So we say, let me be your friend. Romans 12, 17 through 21 has um, an excellent description of what, uh, what are the steps we take toward being a friend and a person who makes peace. And if you'd like to turn in your Bible to that for just a moment, I'll review three steps that help us be friends with people that we may find friendship difficult with. The first is a desire or an attitude that says, let me be your friend, let's live at peace. If it is possible, live, if it is possible and as far as it depends upon you. Now the scripture has this fa fact, factual and frank recognition that there are some people you can't live at peace with. Even if you're at peace within yourselves, they've determined not to live at peace. So Paul wisely says, as far as it depends upon you, if it's possible, live at peace with everyone. So may it be the disposition of your heart, first of all, is a desire to be a friend and to be at peace. The second advice that Paul gives toward being a friend with difficult people is withhold vengeance. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So don't uh, retaliate is what he is saying. And the third thing that Paul says in that little verse is, look for an opportunity always to show love. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. I always thought that was a weird verse. Uh, like saying, well, show love to somebody so that you can say to them, what, by the time they get done realizing how swell you've treated them after they've been so nasty, you've been able to say by your love, shame, shame, shame. You ought to feel sorry for yourself for the nice way I've treated you, which just becomes another way of being self-righteous. Till you dig around a little bit with that text and discover that it's a quotation directly out of Proverbs 25 verses 21 through 22, and that Paul is quoting that passage, and in Proverbs, that particular proverb had to have some reference to the culture, and sure enough, there is in biblical times reference to a cultural practice that originally came out of Egypt that said that when a person gave evidence that they had publicly repented, they carried around a pan of burning charcoal on their head to show that they had repented. And that's really what Proverbs is saying and what Paul is saying here. When you get done loving the person whom you are at odds with, their, your love will be such that they'll want to take up the pan themselves. It's not you dumping the coals on them, but it's them w saying, oh man, the way that person loved me when I didn't deserve it, I'll take up this pan and I'll walk around with hot coals on my head to, head to show that I am a person who feels badly over what I've done. Be a friend. Let me be your friend. 
The eighth great attitude is, I will rejoice even in my down times. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. When we have lived the first seven attitudes, we would expect to be well-liked and secure. But living these attitudes may generate, as Jesus predicts that it it will, people who have opposition to us because our loyalty to Jesus Christ will stand out. So uh, what we do is, as a Christian, we take responsibility for our actions and the reactions we get against us because we are trying to follow Christ and we say, even in the down times of my life, I choose to rejoice. For our 15th anniversary at the church, Uh, we were given a beautiful frame with a favorite phrase that I have used that was uh, calligraphied into the into the uh, frame not the frame but the thing that was framed what do you call that it was it wasn't a portrait but it was sort of like you do a picture and then you put a frame around it but it was beautifully hand calligraphied and the favorite phrase which you've heard me use a number of times was what happens in you is more important than what happens to you and then there were some, in some different color, in small letters calligraphy, which you can't see too, too easily, and phrases which I had not heard before, there was calligraphy into that, these two great phrases, and it was this. The same wind that uproots a tree lifts a bird. Hmm. I think that's part of, I will rejoice even in my down times, that what will cause another to topple or tipple will cause me instead with Christ's help to soar. And the second phrase that was used is, the opposing force becomes a lifting force if faced at the right angle. Oh man, that's so great. The opposing force becomes a lifting force if faced at the right angle. And that's what Jesus is saying about pressure and opposition in our life that it can make us instead of breaking us, that it can lift us rather than blow us over. I will rejoice even in my down times. Jesus asks us to live with an attitude which allows our reverses to become our successes. Great attitudes. I need help. I am sorry. I am strong, but I'm easy to live with. I want to grow. I care. And I ought to get you to say these with me. Do you remember them? Would you like to try it? Let's do the first one. What's the first great attitude? I what? Good. What's the second great attitude? I am sorry. The third one. Well, there were some different uh, renditions of that. Now you understand why we have four different Gospels that have slight, slightly different word changes. I am strong, but easy to live with. The fourth great attitude, I want to keep growing. The fifth great attitude, I care. I care. The sixth great attitude, my conscience is clear. Seventh great attitude, all right. And the eighth great attitude, I will rejoice even in the down times. See, it helps to take notes now, doesn't it? If you hadn't, a lot of you hadn't taken notes, you'd go out and you'd say, what did the pastor talk about today? Well, he talked about great attitudes. And what are those? Well, I don't, oh, they were great. They are, they're just really great attitudes. But now, now we've got them focused. Join with me in standing, will you?